Okay. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Nikki Engel, and I'm the Policy and Legal Systems Program Manager at Violence Free Minnesota. Violence Free Minnesota is a statewide coalition of over 90 member programs who work to end relationship abuse across all 87 counties in our state. So I want to welcome you this afternoon to our kickoff event for a year-long focus on justice-involved victim survivors. A justice-involved victim survivor is someone who has experienced relationship abuse and or sexual violence and who also had or has interacted with the criminal justice system as a defendant. Research has shown time and again that many incarcerated individuals, regardless of gender, are survivors of domestic and sexual violence. According to the ACLU, nearly 60% of people in women's prisons nationwide and as many as 94% of some women's prison populations have a history of physical or sexual abuse prior to incarceration. Victim survivors may find themselves criminalized as a direct result of necessary survival strategies or may find themselves unable to access safety as a result of prior or current justice system involvement. The central goal of the coalition's year-long spotlight on justice-involved victim survivors is to bring attention to a group of victim survivors who are disproportionately women and LGBTQ plus people of color and whose unique needs and safety concerns are rarely placed front and center in our domestic violence movements. To that end, today we are thrilled to welcome Kelly Dillon and Marissa Alexander. Before I introduce Kenosha Davenport, today's facilitator, and turn it over to her to lead this conversation, I just want to call attention to the tools we will use to help those of you watching engage in the conversation. So if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you're going to see a toolbar. On that toolbar, you can click on chat and Q&A. So these tools are available to you throughout the session. If you're having technical issues, please let us know that by a private chat by selecting all panelists. If you have a question for Kelly or Marissa, please ask your questions using the Q&A tool. You can also give a thumbs up to the questions you'd most like to see answered today. Finally, the chat tool is where you can chat with other participants during the session. Please send a quick welcome to Kelly and Marissa using the chat tab. Panelists may not be able to track the chat during the session, but I will be doing so. This keynote is being live streamed to YouTube where you will be able to watch a recording of this session on demand at any time. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's facilitator, Kenosha Davenport. Alabama native, native Kenosha Davenport is the executive director of the Sexual Violence Center, which serves Carver, Hennepin, and Scott counties here in Minnesota. She currently directs a staff of 17. Kenosha has dedicated 17 years in the movements to end domestic violence and sexual assault. Early in her career, she's worked as a shelter relief worker, a volunteer coordinator, prevention educator, and rape response program coordinator. In 2008, Davenport first took on the role of Executive Director for Victim Services of Coleman, West Virginia. In 2010, Davenport worked with state representatives across the aisle to pass a bill that assessed additional court fees to perpetrators of violence. These fees became a new revenue source for her organization. In 2017, West Virginia Coalition Against Domestic Violence honored Davenport with the Diane Reese Advocacy Award. Throughout her career, Kenosha has served on many community and state level boards. She is currently serving as the board chair for the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and she also serves on the board of directors for Violence Free Minnesota. I know all of us are very happy here in Minnesota that you are now here in our great state, Kenosha, and that we have you with us. So, and now with that, I will turn it over to you, Kenosha, to lead today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. Uh, <clears throat> but before we get started, I do want to take a minute to introduce our panelists. We have Kelly Dillon with us. Uh, and Kelly is the chairperson for the Empowerment Congress uh, Southeast Neighborhood Council. She is a survivor of domestic and gang violence and an advocate for violent prevention and intervention programs. Kelly found herself incarcerated at the age of 19 and sentenced to a 15-year sentence. Her case then testified from a domestic violence incident and defense from protecting an attack from her abuser. While in the California Department of Corrections, she began her advocacy and community social work, assisting fellow inmates with counseling and social justice issues. Since that time, Kelly continues to advance in education and has received certifications of training in the areas of anger management, domestic violence, battery intervention program, art therapy, HIV and STI education, and peer advocacy, homeless prevention, just to name a few of the uh, certifications that she has. So Kelly, definitely welcome to today's panel. 
Next, we have Marissa Alexander, who is an inspirational speaker and advocate for social justice, equity, and criminal justice reform. Formerly denied stand your ground immunity after firing a warning shot to defend herself in a domestic violence incident, Marissa now shares her stories in the hope that it would heighten awareness and help end the epidemic. She has been featured on CNN, MSNBC, Court TV, and TV One in time and essence. Marissa has spoken to students of sociology, law, ethnic studies, and psychology at Harvard Workforce, Georgetown, UC Irvine, DePaul, and others. And so before we get started, I, I wanted to give Marissa the opportunity, since many of you have already watched the film, Belly of the Beast, which featured Kelly's story. I wanted to give Marissa the opportunity to share her story so that you all can um, ask additional questions and kind of get an idea of where we're gonna take today's discussion. Marissa. Hey, thank you all for the invitation. Thank you all for um, joining in today. And I'm so grateful to uh, actually meet Kelly online, but the film was very powerful. So I'm grateful to be a part of this conversation. Um, so my story centered around initially being criminalized as a survivor. And so um, I had an issue, a situation where my life was threatened by my, my then husband. I had just given birth to um, a premature baby. And in defense of the threat, I fired a shot, which has been called a warning shot. And um, I went to trial. I was arrested, obviously, and went to trial. And I was denied the standard ground. Um, I actually had the hearing, but I was denied immunity. And from that point, I went to trial. I lost trial, and I uh, appealed. And during that time, there was a lot going on in the nation, especially Florida, because of what was happening or had happened with uh, Jordan Davis's case, um, as well as um, Trayvon Martin. So there was a lot going on around that time. And so through um, some advocacy that started with myself, as well as be getting it out to you know the masses and a lot of the uh, grassroots organizations, we were able to raise the conversation and obviously um, the movement for me, the Free Marissa Now movement, uh, for me to be able to be free. But initially it started as me being a survivor who was criminalized for self-defense. Okay, thank you so much, Marissa, uh, for sharing your story. One of the things that I wanted to just check in with um, our audience about today is I wanted to ask them, like, prior to watching the film, what was your level of familiarity with incarceration and its effect? And so if you just take just a minute to respond in the chat, we would greatly uh, appreciate it. Just want to kind of see where everybody's at as far as understanding of the, the impact that uh, the prison system sometimes has and, and also the, the how familiar are you with how um, the DV movement has um, kind of contributed to some of those uh, incarceration rates. So uh, if people can take a minute and the question was prior to watching the film, what was your level of familiarity with the incarceration and its effects? And then I see that we also have a hand up from COA. Uh, and so if you can put that in chat and or um, put it in the Q&A, that would be helpful. Okay, well, we'll keep going. I didn't see, um, I, I think people are still getting time together. And so one of the, um, a common factor of both of your incarceration is both that you were both victims of domestic violence. Can we talk a little bit about uh, what did the response from the DV movement look like for, for you? And then what would you have liked to have seen as a response? So just jumping right into it. Yeah, I'm going to start because I think Ms. Marissa's, her, um, her incident is a little bit more recent. Um, and I do remember um, also advocating 
advocating for you, Marissa, about that um, being a survivor as well and also criminalized for gun violence. And so, but I'm so glad that you're home and, and I'm in the panel with you right now. So thank God for that. But I'm gonna go back a little bit. And um, my case was all the way back in the 90s, right? In the mid to late 90s, where there was a little bit there was little known about domestic violence and how it plays out in the criminal justice system and in courtrooms. And back in those days, um, a, a woman's or a man's or whoever the victim or survivor was, the, the actual record of abuse was not even allowed to be um, a part of the sentencing or to be a part of the um, evidence that could actually stand for a survivor. So a lot, especially I'm from the state of California in Los Angeles. So back then it was so many women, especially women of color who were getting life sentences, life without the possibility of parole, who were actual victims who were, who were actually being arrested the day of with scars and, 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 and bruises and, and sexual assault and things like that because they were defending themselves for their from their abuser. Um, and so for me, there was no support from the DV world or the DV uh, movement at the time. And, um, and I just want to go back and say, because I'm pretty sure Marissa can also understand that when it, I always say that the, the domestic, the help that a survivor will get starts with the first responders and the first responders is law enforcement. <laughs> those are the first responders. And so the in that most African-American women, especially women who live in the hood or live in low um, income neighborhoods or where there's high crime communities, um, they're, they're, we're very rarely seen or either have the compassion or responded to as survivors or victims. We're not looked at as victims initially. And so we're, we, we kind of, when first responders show up on the scene, we're on the scene, we're kind of um, interrogated and um, tr treated and handled harshly um, when we were the ones who were calling for help. So I'm just going to say, you know, so I could pass it to Marissa and maybe we can, like you say, start the conversation on it. But that's what my experience was. There was absolutely no um, compassion, no support or no help for me as a survivor um, at the time. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I hate to add that that hasn't changed much. And um, I want to be very clear about there being, you know, the domestic violence movement as it as an institution versus people in the advocacy that work with them, but know that there's a difference and understand that for the most part, the black experience does not align with the traditional domestic violence movement. And so what I did have is as an institution, as the actual organizations, they did not support me, but advocates within those um, arenas did. And so I can specifically tell you that um, the DV organization here in um, my home state, in my actual city, was threatened. Their funding was threatened if they were to support me once it had reached a, um, a national level. So there was that disconnect. And then there were women um, or advocates from other states who were a part of other coalitions or organizations who had to step outside and join the Free, Mar Free Marissa Now movement in order to be able to advocate for what they have seen um, in the movement for some time that Beth Ritchie wrote about and Andrea James, no, no selves to defend. So these, I think that's important to recognize and it's unfortunate that that really has not changed um, much at all. And in some ways it has negatively impacted the trajectory of where we could be going in terms of how we support all victims, because there's this, well, you know, you have your victim versus the actual uh, perpetrator. And so if we're automatically seen as a, a person who can't defend themselves, as she, as Kelly mentioned, the first responders, um, then we're not even seen as a victim to begin with. And so the second part of the question was, what would you have liked to see in that response? What kind of response would have really helped you out in your situation or maybe made you feel a little less alone in this process? Yeah. Um, so 
back then, I think that what could have helped in which now that we've in the work that I've done in the city of Los Angeles advocating for um, certain types of response as we look at now how um, we rely on law enforcement and how do we partner with community-based organizations. I would have loved for someone, a, D, a DV liaison, a task force, um, somebody who was from the domestic violence task force be able to accompany law enforcement on these specific calls. So when law enforcement comes on and then they, they're um, on the scene and they can assess because they have they have the ability to set, assess whether or not this is a DV incident, is these two couples or what's the lethality risk of it? Is there a gun involved? Is not if there's just hands that's being flying and dishes across or whatever the situation may be, um, then they have they, they could have said, OK, we want to radio in or we calling for um, task forces or anybody that can come and assist in this particular is incident. And then I could have been given resources at either as access to resources accessibility to them meaning that somebody could have took me on a ride to a shelter or something like that um that would have helped tremendously at that time um if we could have had that but instead the the very resources that was actually available for me was actually used against me and what I mean by that is when when I was told or if we uh, OK, if we call somebody or if we come out here again to help you, then we're going to call DCFS or Child Protective Services. And then you're going to lose your kids, which diminishes my willingness or my trust to call and ask for help again, which then increases my risk of being harmed or even murdered or either just not receiving any care. So these are some of the things that we've had, like Marissa said, that was over 25 years ago. I know I don't look it, but it was 25 years. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that's a whole nother story. But uh, but no, but it was 25 years ago, right? And it's, it's how are we making such innovative moves when it comes to public safety and all these other areas, but DV, as Marissa say, it's a slow movement and, it's, and, it, and it reaches with so much resistance. And so I just want to say that that could have helped is to have community-based organizational support in which her community-based organization support was threatened. So I'm going to just, I'm going to pass it to Marissa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I have to be completely honest with you. I, I don't, if, you, if Kelly's situation is 25 years ago and now mine is like 11 years ago and we are just like having this conversation, I just feel like the roots are too deep for me to be like, yeah, if, you know, I guess it would have been helpful to have someone to come in and say, you know, as we, we've seen this situation before, because he, here's the thing. Even when I was arrested, I had a um, restraining order in place. OK, so the officer looked the restraining order up, <laughs> but it didn't even register. And I don't know that the way that it is strategically designed, that it that anybody would have been able to come on and be like, well, hold up, let me, you know, especially with a gun involved, because it's just a certain level of, um, I don't know, it's a certain, it's a different, it takes things up a notch. And so what I would like to see moving forward is really getting into more aspects of prevention. And I know that's probably not your, like your traditional answer, but my thing is let's stop it before it even starts. Because once it gets into those um, complicated dynamics and relationships and things like that, the system doesn't, it just doesn't have the time. It doesn't have the oversight. It doesn't have the resources to start sorting out those nuances. Mm -hmm. But if it's possible that I can speak to um, younger people, because this is stuff that they see on a regular basis, because the fact of the matter is there's such a huge disconnect between first responders in the black community to even begin with nine times out of 10, I'm suffering in silence anyways, so I'm not going to call you. So what is it that we can do in terms of really um, supporting our relationships and that dynamic um, to begin with? 
you know what I mean? So almost like some of the older tribal things, how we kind of handle things in house where we, you know, have someone within the community that can, that can sort this thing out. And it's kind of like what Chicago with the shy was doing on like the last season where they were working through their things on their own and not getting the police involved. And it's, it's not easy and it's tedious work, but I guess by the time we get law enforcement first responders in that level of entanglement is so complex and so um, very well struct structured and strategic, it's so hard to walk it back, which is why I'm thinking prevention, or at least that's what I believe, really getting into the root of how we deal with our relationships, our communication, conflict resolution, and, and teaching that from a young age and not putting the onus on women and girls. Like this is something that boys and men have to be a part of too. And um, really starting there because it, 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 to me, by the time we, I got to that place with everything I had in terms of in an arsenal for my being able to say, oh yeah, common sense even. And even if you're not like, you, you, common sense is like rare for you. Just factually, this made sense. It, it, was, it was just something that's ingrained and entrenched in this system. It was just too hard to walk it back. And it happens so often um, within our communities, which is why prevention is always my you know, how do we even prevent it from, to begin with? Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of my thoughts. I, I want to, can I just piggyback a little bit on what she was yes. saying? Yes, yes. Is that what brought up that for me, Marissa, is that most most victims or survivors are caught up between two evils, right? Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. is that is the evil that's within the household and then the fear of if I do call, what what is this person or what are these, this, this, outside help is going to do to my family when I do call? Am I going to be arrested? Is my partner going to be killed? Are we both going to go because there's a there's a lack of empathy or understanding to the dynamics of what's happening? Um, and so they're caught up, like you said, in the end, that goes back, what you say is that we suffer in silence. And then right. in the vulnerable and especially communities of color, the no right. snitch, mm -hmm. <laughs> the no snitch policy also mm -hmm. um, is really... It's, it's to me, it, it, it's a, it's bondage. It becomes mm -hmm. bondage. Um, and mm -hmm. people don't even understand, like you said, the new generation, the young generation, because we also, like you, we teach um, young young people about teen um, dating violence and intimate partner violence as well. And understanding that they have this, these cultures that are, that are intersecting, that is either, that's, that's allowing for the continuization of victimization of themselves, of the community and so forth. So I just wanted to just um, kind of talk, talk about that as well. And then I, I do gang intervention as well. So I know like you were saying with shy, which is the public safety part, which is mm -hmm. that we, we are community intervention workers. So right. where is it that we do try to assist and collaborate with DV agencies, um, law enforcement, um, sexual assault agencies in order to talk to our community without the um, extreme interference of law enforcement is like you said, trying to prevent things from further happening or either walk, work, working with all three to make sure that everybody either um, empowers themselves out of the situation, educates themselves or either get treatment for whatever it is that's going on. Mm -hmm. Definitely understand what you're saying, Marissa. Okay. Mm -hmm. I do want us to uh, pivot just a little. I want to make sure that we get in the conversation about uh, reproductive rights, right? Uh, and so as someone that is an advocate of reproductive rights, mm -hmm. my quote normally would center and focus around back in the 1980s in North Carolina, but after and the forced sterilizations that happened in North Carolina. But after, um, after seeing the film, I had to update my reference because now we're in the 2000, you know, uh, 2008, 2010 um, time frame, still dealing with reproductive rights as a, in the intersection of, of race too and the forced sterilization that has been a part of the Black community for as long as... <laughs> We've been in the community, right? And so, um, so, so in the United States, those conversations frequently center on the right to have or not to have an abortion. However, we know that that term reproductive justice it, it was created in 1994 by a group of Black women who recognized uh, that the women's rights movement led 
by and representing uh, middle class and wealthy white women could not determine or define or defend the needs of women of color and other marginalized women and trans people. And so I wanted to open up the conversation to hear a little bit about like, what does the term mean for you as far as reproductive justice? And then also your, uh, Marissa, if you can add in your reaction in the film when you realize that this was something that's still happening, still going on, um, you know, in in the 21st century. And so, yeah. Did you want me to go first? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Go on. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. So um, just go as we talk about, even though we're talking about domestic violence and so many different issues that affect our community, but um, we know that prison and incarceration is a form of reproductive oppression in itself, right? And I think that as you talked about um, the women that started the RJ movement, which is the reproductive justice movement, um, like Dorothy Roberts has a, um, a book called Killing the Black Body. Right. And she 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 talks about how systematically through incarceration, through um, just the way the system is um, sterilizations and um, how how society or those that are in power have feel like they have a right to choose who should live and who should die. That's the only thing. <laughs> That's the only thing I'm just going to say, who should live and who should die, who has a right to have families or to be sustained in those families. And we even see that when it comes to, because we have a couple of movements out here in California that we are um, bills that we have in front of us, which is like justice for survivors and um, give us back our babies, which is that how women who are incarcerated, like Marissa was may maybe for a incident of, of the DV or shooting or have like that, 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 that the government comes in and takes the child or takes the children. And then don't, even though she served her time or she's giving them the program that they asked for, don't want to give her her children back. And so, and that ch those children are being adopted out across the country for um, women and, and some people who have like only one offense, you know? And so, um, and then, looking at, as you said, with the abusers, poor people, um, the weaker disability, you know, the weaker population in which the, how they view it or those with disabilities, you know, the whole thing that happened to me around the sterilization is the fact that they feel that we were a burden upon society. So when you are a person who come out or you've been being called or you're calling for support because of DV issues, continuously maybe this is your third or fourth dv call now instead of you becoming a, a a someone a citizen in society that actually needs support you are looked at as now a burden a nuisance to society you know what i'm saying so the so the easier thing is to lock you up and take your children or look at at the fact that you cannot manage you are not capable of being a good parent. And so therefore you have someone that's in power that looks at you and what they believe to be the potential of your life or the potential of your children's life and then choose whether or not that you should have the ability to reproduce life. You get what I'm saying? So, um, and that's what the film was about. That's what, you know, we've been advocating for. And, and as Marissa said, and I'm going to, you know, pass it to my sister, but she, she said that all of these things plays a part in why um, certain, certain experiences, especially women, especially, and on top of that, women of color, why we, we keep having to go through these challenges, these burdens and these and these hurdles because systematically is weaving into our everything is weaving into our, the educational system is we weaving is is woven into the medical care system as well as the criminal justice system how do you escape when it's such a trap you know what i'm saying so um but that's that's what i want to say on that <laughs> yeah thank you for that kelly i you know i'm gonna be honest with you i was like um kind of a neophyte when I started to understand reproductive justice. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting to me and how I, you know, came, how I came to begin to get some knowledge was mm -hmm. when the Black Women's Blueprint, mm -hmm. um, who I believe is a, a reproductive justice, you know, uh, organization, you know, advocated for me, um, understanding that I had just given birth 
to my premature baby. So as a result of, you know, the domestic violence, I, you know, went into preterm labor and I delivered, you know, her. And the idea that the state had the power as well as the lack of consciousness to say, you know what, this situation, we're gonna leave this baby in the hospital who I was breastfeeding and um, lock her up on a $250,000 bond. And to me, that's an infringement on reproductive justice to me, because at this point, I'm not able to even get the benefit of the doubt or be there for my child who was still in the hospital when I was arrested, by the way. And so it's, it takes away to me, the sovereignty of our domain of the body. And so when we start putting in policies and these little nuances that um, is directed at preventing black life, because that's essentially what it is, a people of color life. This is, this is the right um, they are trying to distort, take away. It's such a blow to humanity. Um, it just, it's really debilitating in the humanity and thus the community. And so when I, I, you know, I'm looking at the film and I'm like, I, I, I remember for the first time having extreme menstrual pains when I was incarcerated. That was the first time in a long time. And I don't, and I was like, when I was in the free world, it was not that bad. But once I got incarcerated, it was bad, you know? And then hearing about, you know, young, um, about women coming in and being shackled, you know, during birth, childbirth. Um, I know of a, um, an advocate who, um, last name, Pamela Wynn, who advocates because she lost her baby because they would not, um, you know, unshackle her. She lost her baby. In, in another county in, in Florida, a young woman was not taken serious. Um, she was pregnant. She was in labor. They did not take her serious. And she delivered her baby in jail on the floor, stillborn, the baby died. And so th these type of egregious and just inhumane acts are what the, to me are also a violation of reproductive you know, justice. So to me, those things um, are all together. And one of the things is just a positive note is I'm starting to see a recent increase in doulas um, because we are seeing that we are not able to um, get the level of, of care that we need taken serious, even be acknowledged as someone who is having pain in childbirth when we go into certain healthcare systems. So I'm, I'm really grateful to see the increase in doulas um, being a part of the communities of color, child, you know, birth mm -hmm. seems to be a reemergence to me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you both for that. Um, and so, you know, uh, as we, you know, have had discussions here today, one of the things that kind of both you said or resonated with me that you were both speaking to was the fact that um, many um, uh, black women and you know women of color don't see traditional uh, domestic violence advocacy agencies as a resource for them. And I wonder um, what those organizations can do like you know to kind of help combat that belief that you know um, that they're not able to survive provide those needs or by reaching out to them, uh, more harm will be done, um, you know, and so wanted to have a discussion about that. But then also I've been in room and spaces with orgs and it's like, well, we're not seeing, you know, people of color in our numbers. And so I, I think it's helpful for them to be able to hear like, what are some ways in which they can improve to, or make changes so that it's, less um, scary to engage and interact with them. I can think of a few, actually. For one, um, it would be great to have people um, who are formerly incarcerated, women of color on your boards and in leadership. You need representation because if all of you look 
like the dominant culture, you don't necessarily have the lens into my experience. So it would start with having people who have diverse experience, you know, and backgrounds to be a part of decision. I mean, and I'm not talking about just show up and, and have a picture and a name and a title. I would like for these people to have decision-making power so that we're not just serving one group and, and following one narrative that we actually have diversity built in. So you have formerly incarcerated people, you have women of color and they're on your board and they're in your leadership. And, and that's important because what I have seen as a landscape is that, that the women of color or the, the you know people who um, have the direct uh, contact with the communities, like really have their, their ear to the ground, they are the support people and that's all they really are in terms of the expectation of their job. But they, they have so much of a robust experience. And so to me, I think starting that shift would be helpful. And then when they're there in your leadership at your tables and in your board of directors, listen to them, listen to them. You know what I mean? Um, I, I find that it's one of those things that's like, oh, okay, yeah, thanks for that. And we go on doing the status quo. No, help us develop a program that would, could reach this population. And this is the message we want to, 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 be, to bring. The second thing is, I'm not 100% sure, Kenosha, you're probably gonna know this more than I am, is that some of the funding is written in a way that it prevents quote unquote victims or survivor defendants from even being able to be serviced in a way because they're actually the perpetrator. And so those are things that um, we absolutely need to be able to quantify in the numbers so that they can start looking at it like, wait a minute, you know what I mean? This is a whole group of you know, people who are uh, being, you know, they were victimized, but they also were arrested or the defendants. So what are we missing here? And, or create a whole new funding stream specifically for that in which that is a part of your funding and that money goes directly to that population for which the leaders and the leadership in the board of directors, you know, have some say so. That's just a few things I could think of. Yeah. Thanks, Marissa. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm a hit on that too because I I wanted to hit on those three points. I, I man, I need to be out either. I need Marissa out here or I need to be out there where Marissa is at. But, um, like she was saying, there has to be more cultural competency within the DV organizations. Let you know. Let's start there before we go towards um, government and administrative as well as grassroots. But there needs to be more co cultural competency because in, in the city of Los Angeles, we have these discussions. So I've teamed up with a partner of mine by the name of Candy Lewis with the Positive Results Corporation to hold the Department of Public Health accountable for, and also the, the Office of Violence Prevention accountable of to how services are done in communities of colors and, and also addressing African-American populations of services of DV. And so we've had six, a series of six conversations in which we'll be having another one in November. And so what I can do is give that to either Nikki or Kenosha and he, she can send it out to you guys as well if you guys wanna join that conversation on how do we service the communities of color better? What are we doing as service providers that is isolating or not keeping the numbers? Because within the agencies, the DV, um, the people who work in the DV fields, because I used to work as well as in housing, shelter, DV shelter. I was a case manager for six years and a lead, a lead counselor. And so um, I always, and what I had to start advocating against my own staff, which was, they would say, oh, this client is difficult. Oh, they hard to deal with. And so I started seeing that the turnover of, in, the, in the shelters for African-American women, it was too much turnover. And I'm like, hold up. How is it that this particular individual, these other individuals can have phones, they messing up, they cussing out everybody and oh, she's going through something, but the African-American chick got to go like, oh no, something is going on here. So I had to address it and then bring it and then bring in some cultural competency training 
for my team because I was like, oh no, we ain't we, we can't do it like that. And so, like you were saying, Marissa, just to piggyback, is that we I had to hold the funders of I mean, also the funders, right? We had to hold the funders and those who oversee the programs of a um accountable. And so, like the RFPs is ridiculous, right? What what the requirements for funding, <laughs> the, the requirements for funding isolate small grassroots organizations that are within the community that can directly, that's educated enough, experienced enough to actually um, help the community. They are, they are, they can't grasp the money, they can't grasp the money, <laughs> they can't grasp the num numbers. And so either those agencies in which we've been um, also holding the county and the city is to provide, as you said, Marissa, um, um, capacity building and infrastructure building for those grassroots organizations so they can meet the requirements that's necessary in, in order to maintain the funding if it's given to them, right? And that's helped those grassroots organizations that's in the community that know the community, right? Instead of these larger ones that are disconnected from it. And so those are all, like you say, I'm, I'm all, I'm all with you and everything that you said, that's exactly what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think y'all uh, definitely talked on some of the, some of the core issues that, that we often talk about in, in doing this work, you know, that, that the funding is such an issue, but we also have to take into account how we got to some of the places with the funding, right? And then how do we build that advocacy back into our movement? Because when VOCA and VAWA was first authorized, it was done also with the team of, of advocates, right? Advocating for what they felt at the time was the way to go, but we've learned differently. And so it's now time for us to get to the table and, and have a group that is representative of the entire movement and not just the select few. So I definitely uh, think that is uh, an important, um, that it should be looked at uh, deeper. And then I think uh, what you all said about uh, the grassroots organizations, right? Uh, for a lot, for many years in this movement, it was the bigger orgs that were kind of, you know, like, hey, this is the way we're doing it and we're professional and anybody that doesn't follow this code. And so what that began to look like is that small grassroots org, culturally specific orgs weren't being invited to the money or to the table. And so I, I definitely think that's something that our movements have to address. And it's like, all right, Kenosha, you operate a mainstream organization, uh, the Sexual Violence Center. Like, do you have to go after that funding? And my answer is no, we absolutely do not. Uh, Sometimes I stand down in a very intentional manner so that I can make sure that small grassroots organization has that opportunity. Um, I do, I you know, I my organization is financially stable. And because of that, I can kind of pick and choose which funding that we go after. And I'm not about gobbling. And so encouraging other orgs to say, is that a, a true need or can you take a little less so that someone else can have a little more? And so having those conversations, I, I think as well. I do see uh, that there's some chats coming in as well as uh, questions and answers, some questions coming in. So I want to make sure that we have time for that because we are almost at the 15 minute mark. I do see a question, uh, a statement uh, from Ashley Taylor Gouget. Uh, the requirements prioritize the organization that already receive enough, and those organizations need to recognize it and step back. Com community and capacity building rather than competition. And I think that's, and I think too, organizations like the Sexual Violence Center, one of the things, one of our funders, they have these huge requirements around insurance. An organization in order to apply for this must be able to do a million dollar policy. Okay, SVC, we can do a million dollar policy, no problem. But I always take the opportunity on the webinars to say, hey, is that really a requirement? Is that really needed? Can you help me to understand why? I can meet the criteria just fine, but I know that because the criteria is there, 
than some of those smaller organizations. So even if that meant we lost some funds, I'm okay with that because we're all supposed to be working towards this very collective action. And so I wonder if you all would speak a little bit about like, um, what collective actions do you feel that this movement needs to focus on as, as it moves forward? Like, what are some things that the domestic violence movement should be considering um, to kind of help to alleviate situations that lead to more incarceration, to a situation that, that may lead to more uh, reproductive rights being infringed upon? And so we'd like to hear a little bit about that. I was going to let Morris. Okay. So um, for us, what, what I have been a part of, um, and I've been working with several district attorney offices throughout the state of California is that number one, we've been working with the district attorney office, because I believe that most offices have a DV division or those that like the deputies that prosecute DV cases or gang cases or something like that. And so we've been working with the district attorney's office, the prosecutors, the, the public defenders, and giving trainings and, and webinars and discussions and community discussions about how what what they're doing wrong how did they get it wrong and what and how can they now begin to shift policies within their own um organization i mean with their own departments but it also takes the lead district attorney right so our district attorney shifted we lost um jackie lacy we gained uh, george gascon and because of that jo george gascon the way he is towards certain um, crime and, and, and the way things are sentenced, he was able to open up and then got a diversity and inclusion representative and to look at those in different that represent different um, communities of colors to come into the district attorney office to begin to make changes um, around um, sentencing and looking at survivors. And also, um, so that number one, that collaboration. And then the other collaboration in which we have is that we bring in um, like like I like with me, I was a part of a movement where I brought in um, those who do um, gang intervention, different types of um, like with homeboy industry, with chapter two, different um, second call. I actually brought in and started doing intersection intersectionality of certain kinds of community violence, domestic violence, in order to get them to understand how can we, as Marissa said before, begin to to work on prevention right? How can we work on prevention? How can we, if you're educating, it's not just about like trying to stop a gang war or stop this and stop that. How do we bring in education in the school? How do we talk about these things uh, on certain, you know, levels to where people can understand where their resources at? How can they get help? Um, when, you know, talk about healthy relationships, doing more um, community-based um, and in the community type um, forums and discussions around it. And so thirdly, um, with Candy, as I said, with Candy Lewis, we also was able to win a grant where we were able to train law enforcement on the specific issues that deal with the African-American community, which is called the POST, the post training, which is the police, or police officer standards training. So we were able to get in on the police officer standard training and to talk about how issue how how and but this is what the training was about it wasn't about us just talking to law enforcement we were able to get it to bring in um community members so like we have at least 12 officers 12 community members and we also pay our community members so it's not like oh we paying you to be here it's like no this is your incentive this is for your time this is for your expertise but um we give them like gift cards whether if it's 25 dollars or 50 dollars or whatever but we give them like 25 dollar gift cards for their time but just to sit in a room with law enforcement for an hour or so and talk about how these these specific things dv response um um, you know, um, hands, you know, hands up, don't shoot, you know, whatever situation was going on, we talk about these type of things. So those are just a few, and I'll pass it over to Marissa, but those are some of the ways, like you say, as we begin to bring it all together. And I just want to say for, for those that are, especially are in African-American community, you cannot be afraid to sit in a room <laughs> 
you cannot be able to sit in a room. I'm just going to say it like that. I don't want to say it how I really want to say it, but don't be afraid to sit in the room with these particular individuals. It's like, it's um, people say, man, I don't want to be in a room with the police. Like, but I, I had to tell them, I'm like, they work for you. <laughs> they work for you. You pay their salary. Like, understand that. I know that psychologically it's been flipped to feel like they doing you a favor or that they're here, but no, they're here for you. And because of that, they have to be held accountable to talk to you. You have to, whether if it's your elected officials, your deputy attorney, your city attorney, all of those people are elected. You chose them. So it's the, it's they, 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 they have to talk to you. They have to hear what you have to say. They have to change some things and you have the power to do that. We have more power than we've been tricked out of. You know what I'm saying? And manipulated out of and, and, and scared out of, you get what I'm saying? But once you like, for, for like, I don't know, I can't speak for Marissa, but I know as survivors, once survivors understand their power and they actually get their power back and then they understand how to use that power like man it's not it's no stopping us like it's no stopping us and so i just think that you know we need to understand our, the power the power of our voice the power of our influence the power of our strength together in numbers so that's why i say that to marissa yeah i'm gonna be as short as i can because i see we have a little bit of time um, for questions um, I, I am all about shaking stuff up mm -hmm. and I am not interested at all in going the route that we've been going. Mm -hmm. I can see where there is value in, in assisting, um, you know, officers and DAs and everybody else with some level of training. But as I think of myself in this 41 years of life, there's things that I am so entrenched in a pattern of doing that's difficult for me to change. So I'm more of, there are certain aspects. I'm just gonna put myself in a patrol officer's thought of mine and I don't know if I can do it, but I'm gonna try. There are certain things that if I had my magic wand that I would prefer that there is an individual or representative that had that training that could I could pass that on to or they could accompany me. Because if you sit me in a room and give me some training for an hour, the likelihood that it's going to even retain with me and I'm going to somehow see it differently when I move, you know, when I move throughout um, my work day and I'm on the beat. I don't know at this point if it's been, is, is it possible that we can try something different? So let me give you an example. In my hometown, the, the, the police get 40% of the city's budget. That means 40 cents on the dollar. We can't get a, even a, a penny of that to, uh, to actually a lot for a, the training of individuals who are, pre, who are survivors or formerly incarcerated, who already have a knowledge base that you don't necessarily have to train. And then, we use those as resources to do the things that we don't necessarily want our officers to take on, or maybe they just don't have the capacity to do it. You know what I mean? With everything else. I, I don't necessarily have the, all the answers with that, but I guess what I'm saying is we're gonna have to kind of evolve out of some things because we cannot legislate consciousness. We can't train in enough humanity for some people. But if we do have people like myself and Kelly, and we are already we already have a knowledge base of what to experience and what the expectation is and, and different things like that, if I'm willing and you have it in your budget, I mean, you're getting 40 cents on a dollar. You mean to tell me we can't say, you know what, we're going to get a group specifically, I guess they call them task force and things like that now to actually do those things. So guess what? I, as an officer or whoever, I can go on doing these things. This, when this, this particular situation that we encounter fits into that, this is where this group would handle this. To me, to me, just it would just take uh, the burden off of some of the things that they have to do. And I think not so much of it, me being basically compassion, but just kind of making sense about it. Because I just feel like at a certain point, with the cold blue and all of the, the thick layers that you have to go through, it is so impenetrable to try to get them to do a paradigm shift 
and we are continuing to evolve and not necessarily evolving our thinking and our ways of addressing and supporting communities along with it. We are at a point where we are in the 21st century and everything is digital and everything is tech, you know, everything is techie. So that's an avenue that we, you know, have to consider in how we uh, touch our communities. I just feel like it, it would be better for me not, if I had my magic wand to bring in and sit you, you know, these people down and train them and, or say, hey, how about this? How about I bring to you this proposal? We get a group of these, you know, five advocates on this task force and we'll be responsible for that just to even to try it out. And then that'll just take something off of them and they could just funnel it through this group. And like I said, I don't know how possible that is. Maybe I'm, I'm a bit naive, but to me, I just think we've got to evolve out of that because some of that the behavior and pattern and that, that, that mindset is just what it is. You know what I mean? And, and I don't know if we have another 20, 30, 40 years to figure that out. Then we got a whole new group of, you know, with people come in with a whole nother mindset, but you already got people right now, me and Kelly and so many other people who have that, have that experience, have that passion, have that knowledge base. To me, it just seemed like it would serve it better um, to, to try that. That's, that's what I'm thinking. And Marissa, just to that point, uh, one of the questions asked by Kissy was, how do you go about finding and locating Black women who were charged with DV so that they can start building collaboration with them when DV or agency know the information but will not share the info? So how does one connect with individuals that may have been impacted uh, without like, where, where do you suggest organizations start? When you, when you, I'm, let me, help me understand your question. I'm going to make sure I answer it correctly. Okay. The question? Well, I'm trying to make sure I understand Kissy's question uh, that's okay. in the chat. Okay. Uh, they asked, how do you go about finding and locating Black women who were previously charged with domestic violence so that they can start building and doing uh, some collaboration with them? Oh, go out and survive and punish. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, like there is a group, um, a whole movement called Survived and Punished. And they are out of California and they work heavily with the CCWF, the California Correctional uh, Women's Facility. And there's a network, an autonomous network all over the states of different people um, who work with this group and they have different survivors that you know have survived and have a, a different knowledge base, and these people have such a robust you know you know experience. So I would say, if it's possible to go out there and just check that out and see what's the likelihood of being able to say, um, you know, to those to those groups. And I'm also um, work with that group as well. You know, how how could I get you to come in, and how, what does that look like? Um, because I believe that would be something you know, that they will be willing to do in addition to the things that they are already doing. They, you know, a lot of what took place with Survived and Punished came from um, my case in, in the way that it, you know, it, it unfolded. And so they have so many different toolkits and other resources um, as well. Is it okay if I jump in here, Kenosha? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Um, so we only have a couple more. Um, I will say that over the course of this next year, um, Violence Free Minnesota will be also pulling together some trainings, um, some collaborations to build the capacity of advocates in Minnesota to work with survivor defendants. And that includes how do you identify them, right? How, how do you um, how do you put your agency or yourself out there as someone who can do this work? How do you work with public defense? Um, so just keep an eye on that. We will be trying to work on building out the capacity of folks here in the state to, to make those kinds of, of connections. Um, so I just, we're, we're wrapping up right now and I just wanna say thank you so much, Kenosha, Kelly and Marissa. Um, that was amazing. <laughs> I'm just so grateful that we were able to have you share your knowledge and your experiences today. Um, thank you, thank you. If you are watching this and you have not yet watched the Belly of the Beast documentary, you can do so for free through this Friday, October 29th. It will close at that point. You will no longer have access to it. So get your viewing in. The link and the password can be found in your event registration emails.
This session was recorded on YouTube, so please go to Violence Free Minnesota's YouTube channel to watch and share the session. And to find out about future events that the coalition is going to host this year, um, please follow us on social media, sign up to receive our new newsletter, or if you're a member program, check out the member calendar at our website on uh, our website, which is vfmn.org. So thank you all. So grateful to have you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was Thanks, wonderful. Kelly Appreciate and Marissa. It. Thank you. So much. <laughs> it was a pleasure, Marissa. Yeah, I so uh, man, it's a pleasure <laughs> to meet you. you now, now I remember we was at the <laughs> yeah in Chicago. The, you, your case had happened, and that's what the story was. And they were right. advocating for you at right. Violence Connected. Yep. <laughs> Thank was. you so much. <laughs>